I read a paper this last year, or and I think it was covered in a bit of popular press, that during rapid eye movement sleep, people can solve problems or respond to external stimuli. Like, for instance, they would give them math problems. They'd whisper in their ear oh. while they were in REM sleep, yeah. you know, what's two plus two? And people would say, even though they were paralyzed, yeah, yeah. apparently they could still move their mouth mm. because they'd say four or something <laughs> like that. Or they'd say, you know, what's your name? And people could respond. And yeah. so that in REM sleep, perhaps people, um, some elements of cognition are still um, active. I'm is, glad you brought that up. That, uh, what do you think? Of, uh, and I don't know the authors of that study. Yeah. And um, and uh, listen, if ever I say something wrong, it's great on this podcast because mm -hmm. someone will tell us in the YouTube comments. <laughs> it's one of the great uh, uses of YouTube comments. Yeah. But I'd love to know your thoughts on that study. Yeah. I mean, is that just kind of a... a uh, an odd feature that, no. or does this have meaning? Should we yeah. actually care about this result? There's no just about it. It's really actually intriguing and interesting and might relate to this paper that I talked about where we, where we said different areas of the brain can be in different states at the same time. So lucid dreaming is another thing we can't ask animals to do or can't ask them if they've done it. But um, we can certainly ask humans to do it and some people can do it really well. And it would be really interesting to see in those people who could lucid dream really well, whether they spend more or less time in this um, asymmetrical state where one area of the brain is in one state and another area of the brain is in another. And it might be that those people can respond to questions during REM sleep best are those that have the most asymmetry or, or dissimilarity or dissociation between subcortical and cortical structures. Or it might be that they're the ones with the most symmetry. We don't know. Um, I do worry a little bit about lucid dreaming because people are, it's a fad, people are really excited about it and to be able to remember one's dreams is fun, often, unless they're nightmares. And, but it's really interesting. Or to be able to direct one's dreams if they are nightmares is really wonderful power to have, um, to be able to redirect a nightmare that has been repeated to something else and then kick yourself out of that um, repetitive nightmare is really nice. But um, I worry a little bit about because we know so little about what's actually going on in the brain. And if this lucid dreaming state is preventing us from, for example, from the locus realis from calming down or the serotonergic system from silencing like it should, and maybe what we're doing during this state is, yeah, we're activating the learning and memory structures, but in a way that's uh, maladaptive in terms of the erasure that we need to do. So maybe one of the reasons why most people don't remember most of their dreams is for good reason. Your hippocampus is in a state where it's not writing new memories. In fact, it's writing out its, the memories it learned during the day to the cortex, and it's um, immune from incoming new information. So, um, so maybe lucid dreaming is bad because you're, you're activating the hippocampus in a way that's writing new memories, and it might be really maladaptive for things like you know, PTSD. On the other hand, <laughs> let me just argue myself right out of this. Um, when I used to have a repeated nightmare when I was a kid, my mother, who's so wise, would tell me, well, listen, just next time you're in that dream, you know, say, hey, I'm in a dream and then change something about it. So she and I rehearsed what the horrible dream that it was. It was a big monster, you know, running after me and my legs were like mud and I couldn't run away and it was just terrifying. And that was a dream I would have, you know, time and time again. She said, okay, next time, what are you going to do when that monster comes after you? I said, I'm going to run away. No, you, that's what you do every time. And it's always the same outcome. You can't run. So let's do something different. Like, what, what could you do that's different? So I came up with, well, I could turn around and punch it in the nose. She said, yeah, that's great. And so the next time I had that dream, I did recognize this is that same old dream, which means that there's part of my brain that's conscious enough to know that, this, that I'm in a dreaming state. And then I didn't have the courage in my dream because I was still terrified to punch you know, or touch the monster in any way. But I did have the courage to turn around and look it in the eye and say, no, that was enough. I said, no. And that was enough to knock me out of that rut of that dream so that I never had it again. I never had that same dream again. And in fact, it gave me peace about dreaming because I knew that if ever there was a nightmare that was just too scary, I could probably do something to change it and knock myself out of it. So even though I don't recommend lucid dreaming on a normal day-to-day -day basis, if it's enough that can, can knock you out of a rut, 
Um, one thing that happens with people with PTSD is they have the same repeated horrible nightmare, which is often a reliving of the day's trauma that, 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 they, that they had. So maybe lucid dreaming can be used on occasion to be a powerful tool because there's so much plasticity that happens during REM sleep to knock you out of that rut of, of reliving that event and, and just change it, you know, and you could probably practice that during wakefulness, um, rehearse the event that happened that was so traumatic, and then just introduce a new element like, you know, now I'm safe. Now, you know, the sound that was associated with that really traumatic thing I should now associate with something else. And next time I have that dream, I'm going to change it. So that sound is now this new thing that it should be associated with safety. And that might be enough, maybe, I hope, um, to knock you out of that repeated nightmare and maybe even start you on the path to recovery. Because if you can calm down about those nightmare states of sleep, then maybe your locus surrealis, which is involved in stress, can also relax and you can do the erasure parts that need to be done. I love it. I mm -hmm. seem to recall a paper, and I'll have to find the reference and, and um, send it to you. We will also put in the show note captions mm -hmm. that described a protocol that essentially matches this um, uh, idea. And well, I think what they had people do was either cue themselves to a particular smell or tone in wakefulness, mm -hmm. then to try and recall a recurring nightmare. Yeah. Then during the night's sleep, they had the tone playing in the background, mm -hmm. which would then cue them to the wakeful state. Yeah. They're still asleep, mind yeah. you, but in the pseudo lucid or lucid mm -hmm. state, and then try and change some variable yeah. as you're describing. Yeah. Some either look the the um, predator in the eyes or yeah. do something different. Yeah. And then in the waking state, take a little bit of time to try and script out a different um, narrative altogether. And it took several nights, as yeah. I recall, mm -hmm. or more, mm -hmm. but that they were able to escape this recurring yeah, nightmare. It was like a week or something. Right. Yeah. Oh, so you're familiar with yeah, the study. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. study. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. We will mm -hmm. um, put a yeah. reference to that. I, yeah. um, I need to revisit that study. It was pretty recent, but I, I need to dive into it again um, yeah. because I think I, I didn't go as deep into it as I, I should have. No, no. But, but the one thing that you, that you, well, you said many right things, but one of the things you said is that they were able to cue the dreamer, um, when they knew when they were going to REM sleep and then they played the sound or had the odor. Now, when you're normally asleep alone in your bed, you're not going to be able to cue yourself, but it might be that rehearsal enough before you go to sleep is enough to, you know, help cue you uh, to that repeated nightmare, remembering what the nightmare is and then figuring out how to cue yourself to do something different.